In this video, we are going to talk about Staphylococcus aureus. This video will be the first in a microbiology series where in each different video, I'll cover a different pathogen. Let's get started by talking about the defining characteristics of Staph aureus. Staph aureus is gram positive, it's catalase positive, it's coagulase positive, it's beta hemolytic, and it occurs in clusters. Now to be clear, Staphylococcus has the word coccus in the name. And coccus, or the plural of coccus, which is cocci, refer to a round-shaped bacterium. So if you see this image on your exam, on USMLE, on Comlex, these are what cocci look like. A coccus is a single kind of round spherical shape. A cocci, which is the plural, is what you see in staphylococcus or staphylococci. And specifically, staphylococcus aureus or staph aureus they're not only the coccus or the cocci, but they occur in clusters. So if you zoom in under the microscope, you'll see all of these cocci clustered together. But if you look at this sort of typical slide, which you see here, you also can appreciate the clustering. You see lots of open space, so you see the background, but you do see very clear clusters of cocci organisms. So this is Staphylococcus aureus. Now I have a really awesome mnemonic to help you memorize some of these defining characteristics. When you think of staph aureus, I think of aura, right? Aureus equals aura. And somebody who's really positive gives off a positive aura, as you see here in this cartoon. So this guy all the way on the right hand side of the slide, he's got a positive aura. You see that light shining from him and everybody's drawn to him because he's so positive. And the way that I use this mnemonic to my advantage is that in staph aureus, that aura is positive. So I know that all of the defining characteristics of staph aureus have a positive aura. So gram positive, catalase positive, coagulase positive. It's all positive because of the positive aura of staph aureus. Aureus equals aura. Positive aura, everything's positive. Gram positive, catalase positive, coagulase positive. That last bit occurring in clusters, you can also use this mnemonic to memorize that because this guy is so positive and has such a positive aura that people just cluster around him. They are drawn to him. They want to be around him, as you see again in my cartoon. So his positive aura is so positive that people cluster around him. And you should remember that Staph aureus are cocci that occur or cluster together. Okay, so Staph aureus. Now this mnemonic is actually really useful because although this video is on Staph aureus, something that Staph aureus gets compared against all the time is Staph epidermidis. And as you can see on this slide, the major difference between Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis is that Staph epidermidis is coagulase negative, but Staph aureus is coagulase positive. So this difference being the major difference between these two is really high yield for USMLE and Comlex. And if you use my mnemonic and memorize that Staph aureus, aura equals aura, positive aura, everything is positive in the one with aura, which is Staph aureus, then you can make this differentiation on your exam. And so if they give you coagulase negative, you know that it can't be Staph aureus because the positive aura is super positive. So this is a very, very handy mnemonic, and I really want you to keep this in your back pocket. Staph aureus has the positive aura. Everything is positive. Now let's talk about the virulence factors for staph aureus. And there are about five that you want to know. We'll go through them one at a time. They're not that bad to memorize because as you'll see in some of them, the name tells you exactly what it does. So let's begin by talking about protein A. Protein A is a protein that you can think of as being attached to Staph aureus. And when Staph aureus binds somewhere, that protein itself, protein A, will bind to the FC portion of immunoglobulin G, which is FC just means the constant portion. Don't worry about what that means, but I'm just telling you for completeness sake. Protein A will bind to the FC or the constant portion of an immunoglobulin G. And when it does that, it basically prevents complement activation, which is to say that you can never get to the phagocytosis stage of complement. So there's no ability for the body to phagocytize Staph aureus because protein A, which is attached to Staph aureus, 
anchored itself onto the constant portion of an immunoglobulin that is key in activating complement. And if the body can't phagocytize Staph aureus, then it can't clear it. So protein A is a virulence factor, which prevents the body from being able to activate complement, activate phagocytosis, and clear Staph aureus from the body. The next major virulence factor is penicillin binding proteins. And specifically in MRSA, MRSA, which stands for methicillin resistant Staph aureus, these penicillin binding proteins get altered. And I wanna illustrate what I'm referring to because although this is somewhat of a simple idea, this comes up all the time on exams, so I really want you to understand what's going on. Now, in the bacterial cell wall of Staph aureus, you have peptidoglycans, which are structures that have to be cross-linked in order for that bacterial cell wall to exist with a lot of structural integrity. So before the peptidoglycan get cross-linked, and I've simplified it on this slide by showing a blue and a red peptidoglycan that get crossed, and when they're crossed, you have this beautiful bacterial cell wall that can't really be penetrated. But before you get to this stage in the bacteria, those peptidoglycans look like this. They're not yet cross-linked. I'm obviously oversimplifying this to, to visually illustrate it to you, but this is what you have. And penicillin binding protein comes along, anchors to the top of the premature bacterial cell wall, and basically cross-links these peptidoglycans so that you get back to that end product, which guarantees the structural integrity of the bacterial cell wall. And what some antibiotics do, like methicillin, for example, is they come along and they inhibit penicillin binding protein so that the penicillin binding protein cannot crosslink the peptidoglycan. Therefore, the bacterial cell wall does not have structural integrity and you ultimately get the lysis and destruction and removal of the bacteria. But what happens when penicillin binding protein becomes altered? If that penicillin binding protein undergoes a mutation or gets altered in some way, and as you see on my slide shown in that fuzzy black teal um, alteration, now it's methicillin resistant. So the methicillin cannot come along and inhibit penicillin binding protein, which means that penicillin binding protein is therefore free to go ahead and cross-link peptidoglycan, forming this structural bacterial cell wall that basically makes Staph aureus impenetrable. And so as you can see, if you're able to mutate penicillin binding protein, that creates a major problem for our ability to target this bacteria with antibiotics. And so the name MRSA or MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And the reason that it's resistant to methicillin, right, MR, methicillin resistance, the reason that it's resistant to it is because that penicillin binding protein underwent some type of alteration, some type of mutation, which therefore rendered it not destroyed by methicillin. So that's a very big virulence factor and that shows up on exams all the time. Moving on, let's talk about super antigen TSST1. TSST1 stands for toxic shock syndrome toxin one. And I challenge you to say that 10 times fast. Toxic shock syndrome toxic 1 is referred to as a super antigen. And what this means is that this toxin binds to MHC2 and T cell receptors. Now, I want to clarify why it's referred to as a super antigen. Under normal circumstances, I want you to just imagine for a second that some type of pathogen enters your body. Normally, your immune response will kick in and knock out that pathogen. You might have symptoms like a low-grade fever, local inflammation. Depending on what the pathogen is, your body's immune system is equipped to knock it out and handle it, and hopefully you don't get too many symptoms. But what's the difference between that, the thing that I just described, and a super antigen? Because this super antigen, in, in particular TSST1, is stimulating MHC2 and T cell receptors, it's doing that in a way where it doesn't turn off. So you get constant overstimulation of MHC2 and T cell receptors, but there's no feedback mechanism, right? There's like no check. Again, I'm simplifying this, but I want you to think of this as this super antigen, this toxin binds to these two structures, MHC2 and T cell receptors, and it stimulates, 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 and just does not stop. 
And what happens is that instead of the body having a normal immune response, you get a crazy high release of cytokines, okay? And those cytokines specifically are interleukin-2, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, right? All those things that you guys learned about when you studied immunology that should be released in a little bit, you know, like a small amount, but there is this massively high magnitude of it that just ramps the body up and doesn't stop that immune response. Again, because you're overstimulating MHC2 and T cell receptors. So when you normally should have some inflammatory symptoms in a toxic shock syndrome, you get a very high fever, a really nasty looking rash, desquamation, you can see elevations in your liver enzymes, you can see end organ failure, shock, and even death. So this is a really serious clinical syndrome that is due to TST1, which is a toxin, binding to and overstimulating MHC2 and T cell receptors, which causes a nonstop release of those inflammatory cytokines. Okay. Now this is classically associated on exams with two things. One, tampon use, two, nasal packing. And as you can see, these things have something in common. They are absorbent materials that get put into cavities of the body and blood goes onto those absorbent materials. And what we think is happening here is that two things really. One, blood pooling in an absorbent material like a tampon or a nasal packing is an excellent nidus for the growth of bacteria. So one, you're creating this artificial environment where Staph aureus can just grow kind of unchecked. And when Staph aureus is growing unchecked, it can produce this toxin, this TSST1, and therefore that toxin is more likely to go and propagate in the body, causing this super antigen response. The other thing is that the actual physical trauma when you put a tampon in or you put nasal packing in can create these like very microscopic tears in the lining of the cavity in which it's being placed. So in the vagina or in the nasal cavity, if you have little micro tears, not only will that super absorbent material absorb blood and grow staph aureus, but further micro tears in those cavities will cause more bleeding, which sort of just magnifies the problem I've already mentioned. So bottom line here, super antigen TSST1 causes toxic shock syndrome with high fever and organ damage, elevations in liver enzymes and bilirubin due to constant stimulation of MHC2 and T cell receptors, which causes a massive release and rush of these cytokines. All right, moving on, we're gonna talk about enterotoxin B. This one's pretty simple and the name tells you exactly what it does. Entero meaning GI system, enterotoxin B. This is a heat stable toxin that causes food poisoning. So if you're taking an exam and somebody ingests some type of food and two to six hours later, they have symptoms of food poisoning, you wanna think about enterotoxin B from Staph aureus. This is heat stable, right? So if you're cooking the food, it doesn't kill the preformed toxin. It's heat stable after all. So it's gonna persist through the cooking and therefore cause food poisoning, which classically arises about two to six hours after eating the food that had the toxin in it. So enterotoxin kind of tells you entero GI system food poisoning. So just think of it and you just need to memorize that it's heat stable, that's all. The last one we're gonna talk about is exfoliative toxin. And again, the name sort of tells you we're dealing with the skin here, right? Exfoliative. So this causes staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. Now say that one 10 times fast. And basically that also causes epidermolysis. And really simply, here are three cells. I'm gonna oversimplify this for your studying pleasure, but let's say that exfoliative toxin comes along from Staph aureus. Exfoliative toxin is a protease, so it's gonna cleave those interepidermal cell attachments. And in store, instead of those cells being able to anchor to one another, they're gonna kind of just slough off. And you see what you see in this image in the top left, you get skin sloughing and that scalded skin appearance. And classically, this will occur in younger um, toddlers, young children. It is very difficult to look at, but that is SSS, all right? So those are all the different virulence factors. Again, you see them on this slide, five big ones that you need to know. The bottom two, in fact, probably the bottom four, the name tells you a bit what's going on. So really you just need to memorize protein A and figure out what that does. The other names give a little bit of a hint. So PVP gets altered, 
Super antigen is a super antigen, so it causes toxic shock syndrome. Entero, meaning GI system, enterotoxin causes food poisoning. And exfoliative, exfoliation, meaning skin, causes scalded skin syndrome and epidermolysis when the protease cleaves those interepidermal cell attachments. Let's conclude the video by talking really briefly about treatment. So treatment for staph aureus, the textbook answer is that you can use penicillins and first and second generation cephalosporins. So these things are called beta-lactam antibiotics. We'll talk about that in just a second because they have a beta-lactam ring. You would need to combine them with beta-lactamase inhibitors. Usually if you're treating staph aureus, this on a test, like USMLE or Comlex, they're going to give you MRSA most likely. So they're going to give you that methicillin resistant staph aureus. And if you're dealing with methicillin resistant staph aureus, you want to think about vancomycin or linazolid, because at this point you're down that antibiotic ladder and you're really reaching for your, your third order antibiotics at that point. You're not going to use a simple penicillin for staph aureus. In the case of somebody that's allergic to penicillin, a textbook answer is that you can use clindamycin. But again, if I was a betting man, I would tell you that on USMLE, Comlex, or whatever other exam you're taking, they're probably going to give you MRSA and they want you to pick Vank or linazolid. Really briefly, I do want to just talk about this idea of beta-lactamase inhibitors because this is really high yield. So I want to make sure that you guys understand this. So I'm going to explain it to you like you're in fifth grade, but if you know this already, just skip to the end of the video. So beta-lactam antibiotics include penicillins and cephalosporins. And they're called beta-lactam antibiotics because they have this thing in it chemically called a beta-lactam ring. And that's what you see in this chemical structure shown in red. And the problem is that beta-lactam antibiotics are susceptible to beta-lactamases, right? Now think of the name, beta-lactamase. It's acing, so it's cleaving. So it's coming along and it's cleaving the beta-lactam ring. So if you give somebody an antibiotic, like some of the penicillins and some of the first or second gen cephalosporins and their beta-lactam antibiotics, if you're trying to treat a pathogen that can produce beta-lactamase like Staph aureus can, then that beta-lactamase will ace or cleave the beta-lactam. So it renders the antibiotic completely useless. Now it's for this reason that when we treat certain pathogens, you're gonna give the beta-lactam antibiotic in combination with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. And there are two high yield beta-lactamase inhibitors that you should know for the purposes of exams. One, clavulanate or clavulanate. Sometimes you'll see it written as clavulanic acid and the other one, solbactam. And again, this should be somewhat obvious, but the purpose of giving these in combination is that if you give a beta-lactam antibiotic plus a beta-lactamase inhibitor, these beta-lactamase inhibitors, which are shown in blue, will inhibit the beta-lactamase and thereby prevent the beta-lactamase from inhibiting the beta-lactam. So the purpose of putting the clavulanate or the solbactam with the penicillin or with the cephalosporin is to knock out the beta-lactamase and then you've got your penicillin or your cephalosporin with its beta-lactam ring shown on the top here free to go forth and hopefully destroy the pathogen, curing you of whatever ailment that you have. All right, so that was a little aside and an over explanation of what the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase business is all about, but I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. So here's your summary slide for Staph aureus. Again, appearance, we're talking about, it's a coccus, right? Staphylococcus, cocci is plural, so it's round shaped. They appear in clusters. Remember that the characteristics, it's all positive because Staph aureus, positive aura. So gram positive, coag positive, catalase positive, beta hemolytic, just throwing that in there. And it's in clusters because people cluster around and want to be around people that have positive auras. Virulence factors, remember protein A, preventing complement and phagocytosis. Penicillin binding proteins undergoing mutations, therefore methicillin can't touch it and it will cross-link peptidoglycan, making that bacterial cell wall super strong. TSST1 is a super antigen, constantly stimulating MHC2 and T cell receptors so that interleukin-2, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, massive cytokine release, nonstop fever, end organ damage, possibly death. Exfoliative toxin is a protease. It cleaves interepidermal cell uh, connections so that you see skin sloughing, problems with exfoliation. And then enterotoxin B, entero meaning GI system. So this causes food poisoning. 
and it's virulent because it's heat stable. So if you cook the food, it doesn't matter. The preformed toxin can still do its thing. Treatment, beta-lactam antibiotics plus beta-lactamase inhibitors, clindamycin if you are uh, allergic to penicillin, and vanc or linazolid if we're talking about MRSA. So that's everything you need to know and nothing more for the exam purposes of Staph aureus.